Well, hello again, everybody. We're glad that we're able to join you again virtually for our, our continued series for Adult Sunday School. And we're delighted to have Drew back with us. And this new series, we're going to look at um, topical questions that are um, challenging, that are difficult, that are um, theological, that are practical, that are biblical. We've had several submissions. And um, so please email myself or Drew, and there'll be a link on the email that we get weekly. And, maybe, and through that, you can submit any sort of question you'd like us to um, discuss. We might, we'll have some guests join us in this series as well, but more of like an open format to discuss some topical issues. I mean, no, Drew, um, before we get into it, you spent some time um, back home with family in Oklahoma. Can you just give a little update on how that was and how your family is doing? Yeah, so uh, about two weeks ago, um, we found out that my grandmother in Oklahoma had passed away. Um, she is one of two living grandparents that I had, um, so uh, only one living grandparent for me now. Um, and we, my family and I had lived with her for uh, a couple of years, two and a half years, um, partly while I was in high school and then um, the rest of my family after I went gone to college. Um, so we were very close with her um, and it felt important for us to try to get back to Oklahoma um, mm -hmm. for that funeral service, even in the midst of COVID-19 and, and all the risks and things we didn't want to travel, um, but we felt like it was important. So we loaded the whole family up, got in the car, drove two days to Oklahoma. We were there for the funeral service. Um, I got to preach the funeral sermon, um, which was both daunting and a, a privilege and an honor. Um, and then we drove the two days back. Um, so it all felt like a very much a whirlwind. Um, and it, it also felt, uh, I'm sure, folks will kind of understand this when, when there's a death in the family and, and everything sort of just comes to a halt. Um, it feels like I lost a week, mm -hmm. um, you know, just like poof, gone. Yes. Um, and that was really weird kind of coming back and trying to get back into whatever normal life is right now. That's all been a little bit difficult. Um, but really thankful that I was, that we were able to be there with family for that time. Um, and thankful that, um, folks here and, and folks at Providencia and at PBA were um, very gracious in giving us that time and, and supporting us in prayer and, and notes of um, condolences and things like that. Very much appreciated from all those that they came from. Good. Well, we're glad you were made out of there safe and we're glad you were back in time. Thanks. So, and this is going to be the new format. We have, um, this may even belong to one of you. We just found this lion <laughs> around the church. So we have, uh, we're going to pick this like March Madness style. Yeah. Drew, do you want to have the honors of uh, the first one? I do. Let's see. Um, I will choose this one. Am I asking you this question or am I? I'm You're sure asking it, out loud. it to us, yeah. Okay. Um, I know for sure that Jordan must have put one or two jokes in, so I'm going to read this to myself before I read it to you. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, th this, this question says, um, the church seems only to be divided just now. Um, how can it be a place of healing? Hmm. A good question. Like, the, we, we see a lot of division. I mean, I, I, I could at least resonate with this question in terms of, um, like, if I just scroll my Twitter feed or my Facebook or um, whatever, you can see divisive posts that are written either from one Christian directly to another or sort of implicitly from like against kind of some group of Christians, some group of fundamentalists or some group of liberals or whatever the, you know, whatever the sort of spectrum is. Um, I see these kinds of posts on social media all the time. Um, I also see, I also see it in different topics like it's most prominent it seems right now in the topics of either the race conversation um, things about racial justice and injustice that we see in America today um, or I've seen it also on the subject of coronavirus so like your church is open and my church is still right. uh, virtual right. you know um, and, and you see these like division and, and, and kind of snarky comments um, kinds of things of uh, all of which I think the, the person who asked this is right, they sow division um, between Christians. And so the question of like, how can the church be a place of healing is a good one to consider. Um, and probably the first place we start is to say, it's not a place of healing a lot of times. Um, and at least starting with admitting that, what, what would you say? Yeah, and I think it's twofold. I, I think it's devices with Christians themselves are 
divided against one another. Okay. And the church is, ha, has been interpreted as a place of division, like nationally, optically. Yeah. But even think of like last weekend, Mike Pence went to a church in Arizona yes. and had a, a rally, de facto rally, in a church service. Mm -hmm. So you have hundreds of people waving American flags, not wearing masks, confined in a church building. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, like, okay, on one hand, this is like a huge class of like church and state together. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's a political statement. And it's also like a COVID-19 statement. So sure. you have like so many things going on that, and whatever your beliefs are on it, like that the church has been coming to focus as, and taking a stance on, it can be interpreted as, we don't really care about social distancing. Yes. And this is one church in Arizona, compared to how many ever tens of thousands of churches are in the US. Yeah. So I think it's twofold. And, and I think for us, um, I'm, I'm Memorial, and um, we, and especially in times when we're not together physically, mm -hmm. and we can get on the hamster wheel pretty quickly. Yeah. Of, and like this, like the us and the them. Mm -hmm. It's like, look at these silly people doing those sort of things. Yeah. And I think we can really kind of get ramped up quickly. And, and, and I think it is, and often in times when the political climate is, is heated, yeah. our, our first instinct is to point out the fault in others, not necessarily point out like the benefit or like what is the, the what is the alternative like where is the healing that we can offer mm -hmm. it's often it's, it's like the it's the critique yeah that we look for it's like well actually like, we're not doing that so and look at these guys yeah. yeah 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 so it's like our and i think our instinct in the end is to go to like the and um, the deflection to say that and um, actually they're the bad guys we're not right but i think your average joe in the street they, they don't know the difference a Southern Baptist and a Presbyterian. Sure. They just see a church is hosting this event and we are Christians, we are in the church. Like we're all kind of tarred with the same brush. Yeah. And so I think it's really difficult to kind of like nuance that in like an optics sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I think you're right. I mean, I find in myself it's, it's much easier to critique than to uh, try to think about how to offer healing or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's the same sort of the, the old, uh, I don't know, proverb or something mm -hmm. about like it being much easier to smash something than to put yes, it back together. Yes, like yes, that, that yes. is just uh, true of us as humans. Um, that as you say, like our instinct or our impulse um, is to point out a fault, is to critique, is to tear down, um, rather than to try and right. build up. And, and, that, and that's a defense of ourselves. Yeah. It's like we're, we're, we're critiquing the other across like denominational lines that everybody else in the public just doesn't really recognize or can decipher. Yeah. They just see it as all the same. Yeah. And, and ultimately like that's not like the it's like you're kind of stopping the fires of critique against them. Yeah. As opposed to like giving an alternative voice to like what can the church offer. Yeah. So I think you're right that um, part of what we're trying to do in answering a question like this and thinking through it um, is to get at the heart of where that division is mm -hmm. and what sort of uh, fosters that division. So part of that, I think, is a human thing, as mm -hmm. we talked about, the impulse and the instinct to tear down rather than to build up. That's just a human tendency. It's not just a Christian tendency. Mm -hmm. We do it as mm -hmm. Christians, but everyone does that. That's a human mm -hmm. thing. Um, I also think that it's important for us to kind of see, uh, on, on the subject of divisiveness, the, the, the kind of ways in which we entrench ourselves in our poles. So, so talking about polarization and seeing how there are lots of things we do without thinking about them that actually force us more and more to an extreme of ourselves mm -hmm. or more and more of an extreme on a spectrum of one sort or another. Um, it's things like um, the, the, the sources that we get our information from. Um, so we might think about, it's important for us to think about um, where are my sources of news coming from? Am I getting both sides, three sides, four sides of whatever the issue is? Am I, am I listening and, and, uh, and reading uh, opinions that I know I'll disagree with, but that I might try to learn from? Um, those kinds of questions, I think, are important for us to ask ourselves. Um, it's this sort of echo chamber effect is built into almost everything we do. So if you think about Facebook or Twitter, like mm -hmm. I talked about the things that I'm seeing as I'm scrolling Facebook and Twitter, um, but the very algorithms that are fueling, that, that are um, curating what you're seeing on Facebook and Twitter are echo chambers. Right. So the more you look at one like thing, the more Facebook or Twitter will give you the thing that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it just built that way because they know that's kind of what people want. Um, and so it's very difficult if we're spending a lot of our time, particularly on social media, 
to get out of hearing the same opinions that mm -hmm. we already think. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an important thing for us to critique in ourselves and see it as something that sows more division in our own hearts and minds. It actually causes me to see, oh, I've, as I'm scrolling, yes, all these people are us. Yes. All these people agree with me. Like this, this is, these are good people. And then as soon as I come across one that is not, they're automatically the them. I, I read a Wall Street Journal article and they had a new phrase called doom scrolling. Did you come across yes, it? Yes, I saw it. So doom scrolling is where we can just get into the cycle of just diving down the rabbit hole of all the madness that goes on. Yeah. And then we can flip on whatever news channel your poison is and just have that kind of, it, it can whip us into this frenzy of like just being consumed by the madness of the world. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, um, how do you think we, like, for you, how do you balance that? And where, where does kind of the hopeful healing voice of the church come into play when you find yourself in those moments of doom scrolling yeah. or, or whatever you want to call it? Yeah. I mean, so I, I think probably the first thing that I need individually, and then I think we need corporately as a church, um, is to encourage like rest and Sabbath from those things. So that might be like actually deleting the Twitter app or the or Facebook app from your phone. Um, that's something that I've needed to do in the past, maybe even need to do now. Um, so like actually being able to find ways to put those things down. Um, maybe it's just disengaging from news for a couple of days. So like the world isn't going to collapse if you don't read the newspaper for a couple of days. Um, it won't though. I mean like that, so sometimes we need to, sometimes we need to put those things down. Um, that's something that we can do individually and something we can do sort of corporately. I mean, I think uh, a, a good example of this is uh, the sermon series we've been doing here at Memorial. Um, we sort of chose to kind of tackle some of these Old Testament characters um, and, and look at their stories knowing full well that it wasn't like, we're not doing a sermon series on COVID-19. We're not doing a sermon series on racial justice. We could do that. Mm -hmm. And it's important to preach on those things. Mm -hmm. And we've touched on them in various ways in looking at these Old Testament characters. But there's a certain amount of sort of rest from the 24 hour news cycle that we get from just stepping into an Old Testament story and saying, this is what happened. This is how these people were unfaithful and God was faithful. I mean, that's kind of the story of the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Um, and, and we can get a little bit of rest, I think, mm -hmm. by just stepping out of the constant scrolling, the doomsday scrolling, or the constant needing to be fed by the news. Um, we're coming up on, an, ele on uh, an election cycle. We've been in an election cycle for what feels like 10 years now. Um, but we're coming up on an election in November where like every day I'm gonna have the impulse to check the polls. Mm. Like, is Biden up by six today? It has Trump gained two points today? Like, what, what, I'm just gonna check the polls. I'll probably do it four or five times a day, uh -huh. some days. Um, that's unhealthy for me. Um, and, and, and so finding some way to step out of that is important. Yeah, and I think for me, it's also the, the balance of the, the work of justice across the board is a long, it's a marathon. Yes. It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And I think we can often feel the pressure to kind of jump on whatever the issue de, de jour is. And, and so I, I've been involved in some racial justice work for the past five years or so now. And I was talking to a friend who's an author and very involved in the space. And he was saying, you know, my phone has been ringing off the hook. Sure. Um, and when uh, white churches particularly, when they ask me to work for them, I'll say, I'll do it. But you have to answer this question first. Why are you only calling me now? Right. And I was, I was like, dang, that's, that's quite the question. And yeah. I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to answer that yeah. if you asked me to. So, so I think in, in terms of like responding to areas that need healing, mm -hmm. and so I, I don't want to just like be on the bandwagon. I want to say that like we are long term invested in bringing justice and healing to West Palm yeah. and making it more like the kingdom of God. And I, don't, and I, and I, and I think there, there are much harder fixes. And I think that um, we want to perform surgery when really I, I think it's like long-term rehab okay. is, is what we need. Sure. And, and I, if that metaphor makes sense. And, and I think that's, this is a Western thing, I think it's an impulse to like just fix things. Like yeah. Whereas actually like the long road is, 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 is trickier to navigate. And I think it, it, it requires more patience, more trust, and more of an understanding of that's actually kind of 
characters. Yeah, in lots of ways. Yeah, it's this like slow, meandering, plodding journey. Yeah, and then you kind of look back and say, "Wow, we've actually come a long way." Mm -hmm. But in the moment, it doesn't actually feel mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And I think the race issue just now, let's say, has it, it, there seems to be like this climactic pressure that like something has to change. Yeah. And I think, yes, things do have to change, mm -hmm. but um, like there is an urgency of now, yeah. but that will require like a journey beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. We can't hang every single hope on this moment. Right. We, we want to look further right. down the road than right. that. Because that's good. There'll be horizons that we're blinded to now. Yeah. And yeah. then we're in five years down the line and 10 years down the line, we'll realize like, well, actually, this needs to change. Now. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. And then I think on the point of healing as well, um, this is maybe more of a corporate thing, mm -hmm. um, but for the church to be a place of healing, we have to, I think, adopt a posture of listening. Yes. We have to recognize yes. that um, we have participated either consciously or unconsciously in this division, and then recognize that that division has, uh, has produced trauma, mm -hmm. or has inflicted trauma, on other people um, in a variety of ways, not just in the conversations of, of race and, and justice and those kinds of things that we've been talking about um, recently, but in all kinds of areas. Mm -hmm. um, and so adopting a posture of saying, we, will, we want to welcome you, whoever you are, we want to welcome you in. Um, we recognize that you might have been hurt by the church in the past. You might have been hurt by our individual mm -hmm. church in the past, or by another church, or by capital C church. By You're disenfranchised. Pastor, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got really bad experiences with pastors, or whatever. Um, people are going to come in with that kind of trauma, um, and for the church to be a place of healing, I think it has to start by being a place of listening, mm -hmm. and not saying, hey, come on in, we're way different than that church you just left. We're probably not. Right. We're probably right. not. Right. Um, so maybe we can be a little bit different by saying, listen, we, we recognize that that is part of your story. We want to hear what that's been like for you. We want to say that we will be here for you. Mm -hmm. We're not going to try to fix that. We're right. not the ones who I, can I, I, fix that. Um, like yeah. that, that's an important sort of healing aspect that isn't, um, it is active because listening needs to be active, sure. but it feels more passive to us. It, 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 right. and, and that, that's hard sometimes. I don't like being passive, but it, and I think that's an important distinction, the distinction between healing and fixing. Mm. And, and I think especially in times of, of like cultural pressure towards a particular aim, we feel like, okay, we have to fix this problem. Yeah. Like, um, can we invite more people of color to preach? Yeah. Can we, um, like, partner with a with an African American church? Yeah. Who, who we think like very solutions based. Yeah. But to really understand, well, actually, um, optically that might look great in the moment. Mm -hmm. But are we really investing long term in how to do this better? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. It's good. Cool. Next question. <laughs> Shall we do one more? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do one more. Okay. We need more submissions from you. We do. We need lots of submissions, please. The harder, the better. <laughs> I don't know about that. Oh, wow. Okay. How do we handle the past sins of those that have gone before us in the name of Christ? All right. <laughs> okay, good question. How do we handle the past sins of those who have gone before us in the name of Christ? Um, I'm always interested in the grammar of mm -hmm. questions like this because um, I think that in the name of Christ part can fit in different places in that sure. question. Um, like how do we handle the past sins of those who, who committed the sins in the name of Christ? Right. You know, like, so we think, of, right yeah, we, we think of something like uh, an, an extreme example is the Crusades, right. uh, you know, Middle Ages, right. um, which is atrocities literally committed in the name of Christ. Um, or I could read that question a different way and say, um, like, how could we, uh, how do we handle the sins of those in uh, who committed the sins in the past? How do we handle it in the name of Christ? Like, uh, how how do we do it in a Christ-like way, sure. handling those sins? Um, just putting this sort of emphasis on us or on those who committed the sins. Um, but this is a great question, um, and I think that the first step for me mm. is. Trying as best we can, this is not always easy, but trying as best we can to name sin as sin. Whether it's happened in the past, whether it's happened in our past, um, or it's happening now, mm -hmm. name sin as sin. Um, which isn't to pass judgment and say, 
so and so is going to hell because they committed this sin 200 years ago or 400 years ago, whenever it was. Um, it's not the judgment part, but it is saying that was wrong. And even if they didn't know it was wrong when they did it, it was wrong. Because we do things that are wrong that we mm-hmm. don't maybe don't know mm-hmm. it, are, are wrong, and we want to be shown where those blind spots are. Um, but just because someone had a blind spot doesn't mean that we can't name it sin now. Does that make sense? I did. Yeah, and, and I think for me, like the, the the question is more broadly getting at how do we how do we handle historical figures that are important to us? Yeah. And I know some of you watch Game of Thrones, so it's. A, Lord of the Rings is often used as the sort of the paradigm for good and evil. Right. And it's the, the evil guys are clearly evil because yeah. they, they're like cave trolls and the good guys are like humans. And but like and Game of Thrones is much more like all characters have elements of good and elements of bad in the right. And even like the really wicked people they sometimes do things re- that are redemptive. Yes. And, and I think that's the same with all all characters in history. And Christian or not, yes. is that sure? Jonathan Edwards was extremely influential in bringing the Christian faith to the states, but he also owned slaves, right? And he never explicitly preached against slaves, right? And he even had a stipend at his church to own slaves yeah. because the people at his church in New England had slaves, right? So you're like, like, how do you handle that? Yeah. Do, do you never like quote Jonathan Edwards in a sermon again? Do you like preach against Methodism? Or do you say that, okay, he was a product of his time, yeah. but yet there were still people that were alive at his time that were vociferously against the slave trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also, it, it, it's, a, it's a total balance. Yeah. And there, there, there are even people that say, that was so long ago, we don't even worry about that. Yeah. Like, it's in the past. Yeah. But, but, uh, but I think, especially when it comes to Christians um, and people who we honor and venerate, and people who have influenced our own tradition, I, I think we have a duty and an obligation to be very transparent with, with the past. Yeah. So like Scotland, for example, mm. and I went to college in Glasgow, and ironically there's an area of the old city of Glasgow, or the new to you, but old to you guys, and called Merchant City. Okay. And, and it was the part of the city that was built on the profits of tobacco mm. and sugar. And there's a street called Jamaica Square, and there's Virginia Place, so all these places that venerate the wealth that came from sending or um, of tobacco and sugar. Yeah. And that only happens from slave labor. Right. So the question in Scotland now, or Glasgow is, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to rename these streets, but we're going to have a big old plaque that says, this is the history of why this is called this place. Yeah. And, and, and I think we like to sugarcoat our history a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and there, there seems to be something at stake to like the gospel or to Jesus, mm-hmm. if these key figures in Christian history have some blemishes against their name. Yeah. And, and I think that's something we have to be more robust with and say, if we um, put any of our lives under the microscope, there's going to be things that look good, there's going to be things that don't look good. Yeah. And that's the Christian path. Yeah. And, and I think if we just venerate people and just show light on the, the good, yeah. I think it just distracts from like, or even like Amazing Grace, and written by Isaac Newton, and it's like the story of redemption, but he kept slaves for 30 years after writing that song, yeah. and he only sold his slaves because he went blind. Right. Like, so there wasn't this transformative come to Jesus moment yeah. as we like to paint it. Yeah. And it's like that song is a, like, I'm even like hesitant to say this, it's like an anthem of hypocrisy. Sure. It's like, he wrote this song about, like, a saved a sinner like me. Sure. But you're like, we would look back at that and say, okay, you, you're saved a sinner, but, like, you own hundreds of human beings. Yeah. It's yeah. Tricky. Yeah, no, it, it, I, I, think it's, I think it's really tricky. Um, I think that um, we've tried to hit on this before. Right. Uh, right. I'm reminded of our conversation we had about uh, Luther and Calvin. Sure, um, sure. Because we, we really hit on this idea uh, of like, Luther has some amazing things to say, uh, and we certainly owe the Protestant Reformation in some like small right, or so large way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but at the same time, we've got these other things about Luther where like, he's, he's blatantly anti Semitic, right. um, in, in particularly his later right. writings. 
Um, he hates the book of James right. in the Bible. He actually thinks James should be excised right. from right. scripture. And then we're going, okay, hang on a second. Like, doesn't the Bible nail it about executing heretics? Sure. Sure. Um, and Calvin, likewise, had yeah. different things. Yeah. Not, not the same things, right. but different things. Um, and, and maybe it's a little bit easier to go that much further back, mm. like another sort of 250 years mm. back or mm. something, um, to say there were some important reformations that were brought about by way of Luther and Calvin's writings and others um, at that time. That doesn't mean that they're perfect um, by any means. Um, I think a couple of things are, are important. One is I think it's good for us to say there are some good things that were mm. said here, mm. and we can find those good things and, and hold on to those good things without taking all of Luther and Calvin and just saying you can't ever say anything right. bad about. And it's like guys. these people are unimpeachable. Yeah, it's like, and and I think the further we are removed in history, the more we can sort of excuse it as like they were more primitive than we were, mm -hmm. they were less developed. That was kind of like a backward time. And but but I think as the church is. 2,000 years old, there's a lot of stuff in there that's ugly. Yeah. And a lot of stuff in there that we would just cringe and be like horrified that the church is being associated with. Mm -hmm. But it has. Yeah. And, and I think similar to the first question, I don't think we can like decipher and say, well, that wasn't really Presbyterian so that did that. Mm -hmm. Or that wasn't really Memorial that did that. It's like we, we carry that legacy forward right. and we yeah. represent that in, in many ways. That's what I was going to say. So the second thing is um, that I think it's important for us to examine the ways in which the cultural uh, situation mm -hmm. of the the people that we're talking about, mm -hmm. whether it be Martin Luther mm -hmm. or Jonathan Edwards mm -hmm. or Isaac Newton or whoever mm -hmm. it is, um, examine the ways in which their culture shaped their own theology mm -hmm. and the ways in which that culture continues to shape our theology, continues to shape the outworking of what they said. So it might be that, let's take a song like Amazing Grace. Right. We can sing it now and sort of leave the, the legacy right. of, of Isaac Newton and everything that he did kind of to the side. We can right. sing it like as a, a beautiful hymn that's impacted millions of people. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and I think that's good for us. I also think we can be critical of the fact that Newton clearly had some things in his theology that weren't quite worked out enough for him to be able to, like there's something, there's some divorce in his theology that allowed him to write Amazing Grace and continue owning slaves. <laughs> like there's right. something not, there's, right. some, there's a disconnect right. there that we can be critical of and say that continues to influence mm -hmm. the song. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we have to stop singing it, doesn't mean, but we can sort of say that's an influence and we, we don't want that influence right. to be a part of our legacy. We don't want to continue that legacy is maybe what I want to say. And, and I think it's an important reminder that um, when we look back a couple hundred years, it's just glaring. It's flagrant that sure. that was like such a mess. And, I'm, and I think for me, it's I wonder what like my grandkids, if they look back at my life now and they'll say, like, why didn't he do more for the environment? Yeah. Like, why was he so consumeristic? Yeah. Like, why would like what will be the, the what will be the critique they have of our generation? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's the one of the things we can wrestle with is that, like, just because we are wholeheartedly committed to following Jesus, yeah, doesn't mean we may have layering cultural blind spots. Yeah, and, and I think looking at heroes or icons of the faith and saying that they did amazing things, mm -hmm. but there was also just huge failings and misgivings yeah. that we find really easy to see now. But it, it'd be much more kind of nuanced for me now. Yeah, which helps us, right? Who are right? Well, I'm over thirty now. Right. We're not thirty yet. Taking calls helps us, young guys, yeah. um, uh, young people, to to battle the sort of myth of progressivism. Yes. like the the myth yes. of progress is, yes. what, is what I mean. Yes. Um, the sort of idea, like you hinted at a minute ago, that things are just getting better. Like we can look back two hundred years mm. and say, well, that was terrible, but we got it better now. Mm. And from that, look further back and say, yeah, it was even worse then, and it was even worse then, which if we actually learn something about history, we'll know is, is not true. It's mm -hmm. not a linear progression mm -hmm. toward enlightenment or toward morality or justice or anything like that. It's not linear at all. Um, but we fall into that sometimes. Mm -hmm. so you and I know can in conversations we've had, but I think young people in general can kind of be like, right. like you said, 
50 years ago, like, how did people not think that black and white people should ride the bus together? Right. Like, I, I, I've been reading, a, we got a book about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, uh, a children's book that I've been reading to Owen. Right. Um, and he's then asking questions about it, you know, like, well, what, what does it mean? What, why did Rosa Parks, and what, 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 why was it important that she didn't get up from her seat? Like, trying to explain that to a child is helpful. And, and it also drives home the sort of idea of like, yeah, how did anyone think that that was right? Um, but we then, that, that sort of idea, if we internalize it too much, leads us to this like, yeah, things are just going to keep getting better. Um, we just need to keep moving forward in time. We'll keep realizing more and more blind spots. And, but actually, we're realizing blind spots from the past and probably creating new ones for the future. Yes, I think so. And I, and I think that, especially when you think about key Christian figures, we almost build this sort of house of cards, this like stack of cards. Mm. And if we like critique them, the whole thing falls down. Yeah. But, but, but I think that the Christian tradition is so much more robust and so much more able to be open-handed and like handle that critique. Mm -hmm. And I think actually our willingness to look at the past and to critique it, mm -hmm. but yet still be able to say like God did something out of that, yeah. um, is I, I think that's something that we would do well to wrestle with more. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, well, uh, um, thank you for virtually joining us in our little um, chinwag here, as we would say. <laughs> um, but please email Drew or I your submissions, and we look forward to a time when we can all be together again um, on this side of Jerusalem or the next. That's right. <laughs> kind of feeling like that just now. But we miss you all, um, and stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.